Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Forging Ahead, a deep dive on the US Department of Energy's FORGE initiative, um, which stands for the Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy. Uh, the FORGE project is, is um, DOE's, certainly the DOE Geothermal Technologies Program's flagship initiative and within uh, larger sections of within DOE, this is also a, a very major program and, and uh, it's, it's been a long time in coming and there's been great results uh, to date and we're gonna hear about some of those. Uh, my, my background is, is I spent um, the better part of my career in, in geothermal research. I'm not a practitioner, but a researcher and primarily around drilling technologies and such. I've had a long association with the FORGE project, first as a, as you'll hear, uh, it was a competitive uh, down select process. I was one of the competitors and, and uh, my team did not move forward, but we, uh, I've had the good fortune of now being on detail to the Department of Energy as an advisor and, and helping both the Department of Energy and, and a role within the current FORGE project as the lead of the uh, science and technology analysis team. Uh, which provides support to uh, the, 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 the management of the FORGE project and its execution. Um, what I will start off with introductions and um, I'll ask each of you to introduce yourself, uh, speak a little bit about your relationship to the FORGE project and uh, we'll get started after that. Um, John, why don't you kick it off? Hello, um, my name is John McLennan. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Utah. And I'm one of the co-PIs of the Department of Energy's FORGE project. Now, unlike my colleagues, um, my background is primarily in hydraulic fracturing, um, including some stimulation at Fenton Hill um, several decades ago. But I do have patient colleagues who are doing their best to teach me about drilling. And I was involved in managing the first inclined well drilled on the FORGE site. Thank you, John. Uh, Fred. Um, I uh, spent most of my career in uh, uh, operations drilling as an operations engineer. I retired uh, about 12, about 10 years ago from ExxonMobil as the chief engineer. The last, after, after which I became a professor of practices teaching at AM. Uh, I'm currently uh, uh, involved with a uh, DOE funded project with Dr. Sam Nonyard here at AM to develop um, a workflow for the geothermal industry, similar to the limiter redesign approach to performance that has done pretty well in petroleum. So uh, a good part of our project is workflow. Another part is making, taking all the technologies that we have developed under that umbrella, a limiter redesign, physics-based limiter redesign approach to drilling and uh, applying them to the degree possible um, in a geothermal operation. So we were involved in, in the well with John earlier, um, and now we were involved in the current well, uh, Sam and I with training and daily support and implementation of those practices. Um, and we, um, well, I guess we probably have two or three weeks left of the, the project on the well, after which we'll be uh, collecting learnings and publishing those early next year. Thank you. Junichi. Okay, uh, thank you, Doug. My name is Junichi uh, Sugiura. I'm very honored to be here and I'm based in, uh, in the United Kingdom. I'm the vice president of Sambian Technologies, which is a technology startup company founded in uh, 2015. And we have developed high frequency drilling dynamics decoders, uh, digital rotary stable systems, intelligent wired motor, and um, among other things. So Sandian Technologies and the sister companies, Scout Downhole, Scout Drilling, and Canamera Coring are all under Turbo Drill Industries, which is a parent company, and provided drilling services and equipment for the uh, Forge project, which is 16A, 78, uh, 32, which is the previous well, injection well, including high frequency drilling dynamics recorders, mechanical particle drilling tools, uh, instrumented to steerable motors, friction reduction tools, coring tools, and so on. So our company develops new technologies and tools for oil and gas industry 
but we also have involved in geothermal, both uh, cutting edge EGS and close to geothermal well drilling. I'm very pleased to join this panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tom, why don't you go ahead? Yep, thanks, Doug. Uh, yeah, my name is Tom Roberts. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, I, I started with uh, Reed High Clog, now part of NOV uh, in the UK um, some 30 years ago. Um, uh, they're a manufacturer of premium uh, drill bits um, uh, for oil and gas. Um, so I started there as production engineering, design engineering. And then in 2001, I transferred to Houston, uh, focused on drilling improvements, uh, later managing research and development in that area. Um, and today I, I lead a highly focused team uh, based, basically focusing on uh, improved PDC cutters, uh, diamond cutters for drilling through uh, hard rock. So we have uh, a team that's focused on the cutter grades and teams that are focused on the um, efficiency of shapes uh, that can be applied to, to diamond grades to drill more effectively. And we have a lot of equipment to, to prove that out and test that, which uh, hopefully we can talk about today. Um, my role with uh, Utah Forge really is to advise on the, the type of drill bits and more specifically the PDC cutters that have been utilized. Um, we, we focus on making sure that these cutters are uh, designed specifically for the application to withstand uh, you know, any, any thermal abrasion or, or uh, toughness improvements that are required. Um, I'm relatively new to geothermal, um, but I would say we're learning extremely fast and excited to share you know, 30 years of oil and gas um, expertise and, and apply that to geothermal markets. So it's great to be here. Thanks, Doug. You bet. That's... Uh been one of the goals of Forge is to is to bring in um, uh, technologies from from parallel uh, uh, industries and, and uh, apply those here and it's been certainly been a passion on my part for for a long time so I'm looking very much forward to this conversation uh, I do think that we should start off this discussion um, I, I I assume that everybody knows what Forge is because it's been such a big part of you know, a number of our lives for a long time, but I suspect they don't. So, uh, John, I'm going to throw this to you, and it'd be nice if you would, you know, provide a background on Forge, uh, what you see the goals of Forge are, um, how was the Utah site chosen, um, and basically what are the plans moving forward from the beginning uh, to the end? Sure. So as Doug mentioned, FORGE stands for Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy. And let's just parse that a little bit. It's, it is, a, in fact, a field laboratory, and it's designed to provide an R&D platform for developing technologies that will make EGS commercially viable and geographically attractive. And the choosing of the FORGE site took a number of years. Um, the Utah FORGE site was down selected from five initial promising locations in the Western United States. Two sites of these were, uh, were hydrated. And one of those, as Doug mentioned, was the Fallon, Nevada site that was proposed by Sandia National Laboratory. And the second was the Milford, Utah site proposed by the University of Utah. Now, um, ultimately, um, University of Utah site was, was selected. Nevertheless, all five locations had favorable attributes and some of the attributes in the selection criteria, um, we can go through those. Uh, the first one was that the temperature needed to exceed 350 degrees Fahrenheit at depths greater than 5,000 feet. So the intent here was an adequately hot reservoir and challenging enough drilling conditions um, to get to at least 5,000 feet. Now, currently at the Ford site, um, as of today, we're drilling a well that's now at 8,500 feet and the static bottom hole temperature is in excess of um, 350 degrees or circulating bottom hole temperature has been in excess of 350 degrees. We anticipate static bottom hole temperature approaching 450 Fahrenheit. The second thing that an EGS reservoir requires is low um, permeability rocks. And at the Ford site, these rocks are granitic. Various shades of granitic and people sometimes call them granitoids. The third thing, and maybe one of the most important things is, 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 is induced seismicity. And as we know, the Achilles heel of some enhanced geothermal programs has been the occurrence uh, or the potential for induced seismicity. 
Now, it turns out that uh, the Milford, Utah site has been monitored extensively by the University of Utah seismograph stations since the 1980s, and it has shown acceptably benign seismic characteristics. The fourth thing that we have to worry about are low environmental risk. There are no endangered species, the groundwater is not potable, and there is no competition for surface land usage. And the final thing, and this is an important one, is that it needs to be a conductive heat transfer regime rather than a hydrothermally convective heat transfer regime. And that indeed is, is, in the, the, is the case at, at Forge. So what are the plans start to finish? Well, I'll try and do that in 30 seconds. And the plan in less than 30 seconds is as follows. Um, surface mapping and seismic evaluations were initially done. Subsequent to that, reservoir characterization involving logging, injection testing, small scale stimulation evaluations, and other in situ tests were carried out in vertical wells. Um, the third um, aspect, and it's ongoing, um, is drilling vertical wells for monitoring equipment. And this monitoring equipment includes high temperature um, geophones and um, um, uh, fiber optics cables. So there are five wells that will be used in the monitoring process. The fourth and most important part of the plan, or one of the most important parts of the plan, is community engagement and outreach. That's always necessary early on in these programs. It's absolutely essential. Um, then we get down to um, the part that we'll talk about here today primarily, is that's the drilling of two extended reach wells. And you'll hear quite a bit about the first well. Genichi has already mentioned it. That's, that well is coined as 16A 7832. And it was completed in January 2021. It landed at a target of 65 degrees tangent. And, and that tangent was maintained for about 4,350 feet to a total depth, total true vertical depth of 8550 feet and a measured depth of 10,987 feet bottom hole temperature on the order of 435 degrees Fahrenheit static. Next, and this will happen sometime later this year, or early next year, there will be a three-stage stimulation at the toe of the inclined well. And uh, that will be subsequently followed by another well to penetrate the triangulated microseismic cloud and create fracture intersections as part of a heat exchange system. And all of this is um, along with ongoing DOE funded research that will use this laboratory to evaluate isolation technologies, in situ stress, fracturing protocols, and geoscientific issues. And so, uh, um, one question we've been asked sometimes is well, what outcome will be considered a success? And as you'll hear from my colleagues on this panel, there's been outstanding success already in terms of adapting and refining drilling technologies. And um, this may not have been part of our initial expectations on the FORGE project, but this has been a very, very favorable outcome up to this point in the project. And Doug, maybe I'll leave it at, at, at that for the time being so we can get on to some of the drilling aspects. Great, thank you, John. Um, so uh, there's been, there's been I five five or five wells drilled to date. Is that correct, John? Uh, five verticals and, and, and six and, yeah. total. So six total, uh, five deep. And so the what I know is is the initial exploration well uh, drilled at I would say normal geothermal rates. I don't know the, I can't remember the exact numbers, but averaging 15, 20 feet an hour or something in that order, I believe. Is that correct, John? Yes. Yeah, so that was the initial exploration well drilled several years ago. Um, and then they've moved on and, and drilled a number of other wells uh, with the 16A well being uh, the next deep um, uh, challenging well to drill. And they drilled significantly better that, than that, than the 15 to 20 feet an hour. I'll let people talk about that. And they're currently drilling a, another monitoring well, a deep monitoring well that is, is drilling at even higher speeds. So the question I'm gonna ask is, is um, how'd you drill so fast in 16A? Who wants to take that? Fred, you wanna well, start? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll volunteer for that one. It sounds like good news, right? So, uh, 
In some sense, the answer is that, uh, first of all, we used BDC bibs, um, which are inherently more aggressive. They indent more for a given weight on bib. When you rotate, you destroy more rock per minute. So that that is uh, just intrinsic. And the question has always been, well, can they survive the rock foot? Um, but let's set that aside. I think Tom's probably going to talk a little bit about that aspect of it. But the way you actually drill faster then is you increase the weight on bit. And, um, and it's really simple. Uh, the, the way a bit works is that you apply weight on bit and, and, it, and the cutting structure indents. Now, a more aggressive bit for a given amount of bit indents more. That's the difference. But weight on bit indents. And then as you rotate, you destroy all the rock, rock to the right of that indentation depth. So drilling faster is as simple as raising your weight on bit. Your bit will indent more, you destroy more rock per minute, or, or turn, the, turn the bit faster and you get exactly the same effect. If the bit is efficient, that's a linear response. I get a, a really predictable. If I get two data points, I can tell you what three and four are gonna be, how fast we'll be going at another weight on bit. So in general, many people don't realize that it's that simple. Because what happens is that as they raise weight on bit, some dysfunction occurs. It's not normal. It shouldn't be there. So what um, what what happened in um, um, in the petroleum industry was we learned how to use mechanical specific energy. Watch the energy consumption per bit (MSE) and what what we learned from watching that was when we could, we, when we could see when the bit wasn't efficient. And then we, we learned a lot of things didn't work the way we thought. And that have, that's began in around 2004. Over the next uh, some years, actually, uh, primarily at ExxonMobil, that, that challenged the idea of how bits work a little bit. When we started really focusing on what are these dysfunctions? What are their physics? If I have stick slip, for example, I'm raising my weight on bit and the bit's becoming dysfunctional, not drilling faster like it's supposed to. And I know how to identify stick slip. Then I've got about four responses the driller can see, do, and decide. And I've got 10 engineering redesign options I can consider to address that. Well, so the enlightenment of being able to see the energy consumption of the bit and know what it meant was a big deal and it really opened up doors for performance and that's what we're trying to do in this project here um, and it's about knowledge it's not about technology so much i don't think we've used any brand new tools there's a little bit of bit evolution occurring uh, on these wells which is really good but i would say most of what's happening in rop is that we're, we're we it's knowledge based so in this process of implementing a physics-based, meaning understand the physics of things, and a limiter redesign, physics-based limiter redesign workflow, you say, we're going to teach you all these physics, the driller, the DD, and then we're going to approach the well by saying, raise weight on bit until something limits you. And whatever that is, figure out its physics, figure out what the driller can see, do, decide, figure out what the engineer can redesign, and redesign that to extend the limiter until something else limits you and whatever that is. And, it, and most of the time, it's not the bit actually. You start doing these weight on bit step test, you do this methodical approach to performance, then you run out of motor differential. Well, go get a different motor or the motor has enough torque, but you think you can go more speed. That's a different motor too, or whatever limits you. It's uh, interfacial severity. I have to do this bit balling. I have to do that. For all of these different kinds of limiters now, the petroleum industry has uh, maybe a decade and a half of experience of just building like, those packages of what can you see, do, decide, how do their physics really work, and what can you re-engineer. And then the key then is for the organization to just be relentless about continuing to pursue that. Now, what's funny is that we don't do that. These teams have, the, the team that, that John was involved in, the current team out there, uh, and the whole forge culture, the opportunity, the setup is there to prove new stuff, right? So it's been a fabulous uh, opportunity, and they are doing and doing and doing, and that's why they're drilling faster. They're 
doing step tests, they're identifying limiters and whatever they are, they're managing. At the same time, they're watching energy, they're watching vibrations. We've had some of Zunichi's tools in the hole, um, some real time tools telling us vibrations from the scout. Well, all of that doesn't help you unless you have an actual workflow that says that you redesign and you change, redesign your change and keep going, which is what they're doing. Um, it's just so, so in the end, I would say we're drilling fast because we raised weight on bit. But the real question is, why haven't we raised weight on bit before? Because we're not using a lot of actual new technology. And the answer is that we, there's knowledge at the RIC site that didn't used to be there before about how to see what's happening when you raise weight on bit, how to stop when you should stop, how to redesign what's limiting you, and how to keep going. So this is more of a, um, and maybe I, it seems semantic, but how you manage knowledge, how you create it in a drill team and sustain it, which is really hard in discontinuous programs. How you create knowledge and sustain it is a different thing than technology. Uh, everybody has the best technology. You just you just call up NOV or you call up Sandian and you got it. And it moves, uh, if you, if you you know, if you go get it, it, it's sitting there ready to go. Uh, if you have well planning time, you have some business model issues in, in geothermals, it makes that hard sometimes. But technology is moved extremely efficiently by the vendors and the service companies and the drilling contractors. Knowledge is extremely difficult to move because whose job is it to train the whole rig crew, the DD, everybody, and all these different kinds of things that aren't generally actually known. The way people drill and have my whole career is you go try different weights on bits and you try to find the sweet spot. Well, it turns out there's no such thing as a sweet spot. There's a place that's not as bad as every other place. And that's what's been happening. If I understand physically this whole, uh, what's happening you know, physically, the physics of it would say, then I stop seeing anything at a sweet spot and I say, you know, it, it's a, it's, I'm being limited to a spot and now how do I redesign what's limiting me from just continuing to go up? So it, knowledge management is a really different thing than technical management. And so uh, we did, uh, we, you know, we, we locked in, we did about 60 feet an hour in the eight and three quarter hole in the granite on the 16A and felt really good about that. We're drilling a 10 and 5 eighths hole now on the 78B and locked in at 100 feet per hour. And that is what happens when you physically understand the limiters to what the bit can do when you apply weight to it. And you continue to redesign until you get to more weight. We're at 65,000 pounds weight on bit. And I would bet that the, the wells that were drilled around us originally probably ran about 25 to 35 and we're worried that was too much. So I think wait a bit, but mostly uh, more so why, what, what limited you from us all from applying wait a bit. And it was mostly knowledge. And that's what's been, a lot of what uh, has happened has been brought to the table. Thank you. Thanks. So, so Tom, real quick, they, doesn't, uh, doesn't more wait on bit wear the bit out faster? Well, that's, that's a good lead in. Um, yeah, definitely weight and bit is, is key as, as Fred's mentioned, but um, we, we developed cutters, um, you know, many years ago, they would be, you know, the, the holy grail of the best cutter for all applications. But actually what we found is that we can develop cutters that, that are specific to various applications. And in this case, we need a, a cutter that's going to be thermal abrasion resistant. Um, but also have toughness for the, for the and, and we're looking at the weight and bit per cutter that's important on, on this design. One of the things that, um, and there's a handout that's, uh, that we've, we've uh, uh, provided uh, next to, to, for this session to, to look at, but what, what we looked at here is we've done a couple of things. One is we've done, we've looked at thermal resistance on cutters and we tried drilling on shear white granite, which is very similar to the rocks that we're drilling here in Forge. And we found at a very high surface speed and a very low depth of cut, even if it was a thermally leached, uh, you know, performance cutter, it would wear out very quickly. And so if you spin it fast, very low depth of cut, then the cutter would wear out. And, and we, we then took another grade of cutter 
and took a large depth of cut. And when I say large, we were reaching seven millimeters depth of cut as opposed to one and uh, reduced the RPM uh, threefold. We were able to not wear out the cutter. We were amazed that we could just, we, in fact, we ran out of rock on the test. And I've shared these results with Fred. I think he was surprised to see that, but uh, we've known this for a while that uh, drilling with large depth of cut is the key with PDC drill bits for efficiency. Um, so furthermore, I think the issue with going with low depth of cut and, and, and being conservative, I'll use that word, when we try and find it, as Fred put it, the, the, the sweet spot, is that eventually a wear scar is going to form. And once that wear scar forms on the diamond layer, you get a larger surface area. That means what, what you do to drill faster, you pile more weight on. So we're doing almost doing things in reverse. We're piling the weight on, we're creating larger wear scars, we're creating, which creates more friction, more thermal abrasion damage, and eventually the drill bit will fail before it's time. So uh, PDCs have come on tremendously over the last couple of decades, uh, go into higher pressure platforms, and they're able to take uh, uh, much higher weights and, and they're designed stronger to fail the rock. So if we can go with a larger depth of cut, we reduce that sliding distance. This is the key to it. If we, if we were to um, you know, reduce the sliding di distance by 50%, then we're able to reduce that wear scar generation. So the cutter stays sharper longer and is able to penetrate the rock. So that's the, the key to it. One thing that we, we do we did see though is that the penetration rate started fast on most of the bits that we've applied uh, weight was key to getting fast rp but we did see a drop off so that that's something that needs some more uh, work on in that area and and one area that we're focused to to overcome that is to um, shape the diamond pdc uh, to better fail the rock and we did some interesting tests in the lab what one was with a a Sierra white granite, again, as we said earlier, 28,000 uh, KPSI rock. And we also drilled on the hardest we could get. In fact, they used an explosion, explosive to get it out. It's a quartzite of uh, 56,000 KPSI. And what we found is we, we, we uh, kitted one of the drill bits out, and these were sort of eight and three eighths bits, um, drilling onto the rock atmospherically with full round cutters. And then we, we took it up in 10,000, 20 to 30,000 pounds weight. We then did exactly the same drill bits with a, a V-shaped uh, pointed uh, cutter to, to point load the rock, indent the rock. And we, we then took that up in 10, 20, 30. What we found is that the round cutters would spool faster than the uh, sharper cutters. The sharper cutters were able to indent and fail the rock before they failed. Uh, in fact, we got to 20,000 pounds on repeat tests and repeatedly failed full round PDC cutters that way. Uh, so this is why we were convinced that for hard rock challenges, we were able to try the V-shaped cutter, which, which basically went to 20, and then we took it up to 30,000 and still didn't fail. We did see some minor hairline cracks, which means that the, in the court side, it was getting close to its structural limit. And this is what Fred's been proving out with his team and the rest of the, the force team is to understand what, what is your limiter and how far can you take it? So um, I think the, the weights Fred were in the 10 and 5, 8 section, I, I heard that reaching even 75,000 pounds. This is beyond the normal uh, range that you would uh, reference for that drill bit design. And I think they, the average was more like 65,000 pounds. But by doing that, they've reduced that sliding distance, which has reduced the wear, wear scar generation, and, and able to more effectively penetrate and drill the, the rock with, uh, you know, lower MSC. So that, that's part of the key to, to making it work. Um, and there's more refinement needed. The question is, how far can you go? Um, and then I think one of the things that's been in our favor for the Utah Forge work, work is that the basement rock is, is hard but it's not interbedded so much, right? So if we, one of the issues that we have in oil and gas is we're drilling through soft sedimentary rocks, shales, sandstones, you name it, we're, we're still dealing with abrasion and, and thermal failure, uh, but then we hit this hard stringer and that's when it, it becomes a, a bigger challenge because if you're piling that weight on at that point, that's when you could get a, a breakage of, of the cutting. So. Uh, what's working for us at Utah Forge at the moment in this basement rock is that it's hard. You drill with high weight and bit, and that's what's working really well because we have the cutter technology, we have the right bit designs. 
Well, thank you. Yeah. So, so Janichi, this is a little off script, but you were you were uh, involved in the 16B well and uh, the technology you applied. Can you can you speak to the, the the motors and some of the advances that were employed there? Yes. So uh, this is in general. Uh, you know, we had a shale revolution uh, 15 years ago, or maybe started 20 years ago, and uh, during the last decade, uh, I mean, we uh, in, you know. Uh, we drastically improved the uh, drilling equip equipment's capability. So, uh, of course, you know, bit, bits is involved. Uh, bits are tougher, much tougher now. And, uh, and in order to support uh, very high torque uh, at the bit, the motor has to evolve. So more torque, more power. Then, you know, uh, motor itself can, can support this, you know, uh, torque demand that started, you know, fading, uh, transmissions or uh, stators, you know, uh, the bend angles around the, uh, around the bend, some other areas, uh, torsional fatigues. So uh, everything as a system uh, actually evolved in the past, you know, uh, 10, 15 years. So uh, in this case, you know, uh, in the previous well, we started with a, a lower R R RPG, uh, revolutions per uh, minute. Uh, sorry, uh, RPG uh, revolutions per gallon uh, motor, and then we we uh, we switch to a higher uh, RPG motor that that really you know matching the bit and uh, and the motor that improved the uh, uh, rate of penetration. So uh, vertical, uh, we we had an average on bottom ROP uh, uh, rate of penetration was around uh, ten to 20, 20 feet power. And then the carb section, of course, you know, this is a uh, sliding involved. So uh, it would be a little bit slower, you assume, but actually we went from uh, uh, 10 to 20 to 30, 40. And finally, uh, tangent section, we had a uh, long 65 degree uh, tangent section for 5,000 feet. This is also when uh, uh, bits, uh, between bits and all the drilling system is being matched and then uh, optimize the performance. So finally, uh, we went to around 50, 60 feet power. Uh, this, uh, this was the highest ROP we, uh, we marked. And of course, you know, uh, Fred said, you know, in the, in the latest uh, uh, well, they even got the higher ROP. Uh, but this is because of the experience we had with the previous well we finished in January of uh, this year. Uh, so besides, you know, uh, we had a motor, uh, some other, you know, uh, drilling equipment. Uh, drill bit itself, um, we tried the 30 millimeter cutters, but the, we, uh, we also later tried the 16 millimeter cutters, which works better. And, uh, and later we also found that in a lateral section, removing uh, uh, depth of cut feature from the, from the drill bit actually improved uh, the rate of penetration. So uh, there are a lot of you know small incremental changes uh, we made, and finally we went from uh, 10 to 20 feet power to finally 50, 60 feet feet power. And then of course you know Fred and other team uh, carried on this knowledge and experience to the latest uh, uh, latest well. So uh, uh, I'm not involved in the latest well, so I, I myself is very very interested in uh, hearing you know how how they did it. And they uh, actually, the, you know, the secret sauce that uh, Fred mentioned is the uh, workflow and, uh, and the knowledge and actually the discipline at the rig. So uh, that's, that's really, you know, interesting uh, uh, secret sauce for the success. Thank you. So, so again, a couple things here is, is uh, so you, you drilled fast in 16B. I think you've talked a bit about how you've gotten faster in 78B. Um, if you want in 16A, if and faster in and and 70 the 78B well, if you want to comment on that, that's fine. But but my real question is, what kind of challenges did the did the team um, have to overcome to um, see these kinds of improvements and drilling rates. Were there any particular challenges that, that people want to note? Uh, I'll open up to anybody. I'll take, I'll take that one, Doug. 
Um, from the drill bit perspective, I know that the it, typically we have offsets, right? When when we're drilling, we 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 refine and we improve the cutter technology and we improve the bit designs in any application. Um, that's one of the things about the, the industry is that we we never stop still. We're always improving, and just as Fred mentioned, you know, overcoming any performance limiter from the design perspective. Uh, but the team here didn't really have any offsets to go by, and um, you know, when we started the the 16A well, it was a case of well what do we use for, to drill hard granite, right? So all we had was rock strength um, and analysis and, and estimations. So the guys look globally uh, at our experience uh, in areas such as Oman or New Zealand and uh, other sort of geothermal markets, Poland as well. And the, the, the approach was that, yeah, this is a team, this team, what we'll do is we'll choose bits that are related to hard rock drilling, but let's have a range of them available so that we can quickly move to those different designs. So we had designs that were five, six, seven, even eight bladed designs available as we're, we're drilling now with the 10 and five eights, um, as well as 16 and 13 mil uh, cutters designs uh, all ready to go. So that, you know, as we, as we learned from each application in the morning meetings and the team events that happened, we were able to basically uh, move fast and, and try something different. And, and that was the beauty of the of that first well, the 16A, was that we tried so many different things and uh, th that allowed us to, to learn and take it to the next step. So I would say that was the main challenge was not having the offsets. Um, but now that we've started and learned fast, I think uh, we, we, we can just build up, build from that. The, you know, the, the process side of, of that, um, the kind of the, the approach to performance, the methodology that, <clears throat> that has been built around physics-based limiter redesign and, and what we've done at A&M is we'll go to a company and research their digital data, their history of their wells, we'll identify their limiters for them in advance. We can do that now. Um, and if they choose a programmatic initiative, if they say, I'm going to be so bold as to move from this empirical world where we just try stuff, kind of, and learn from it, okay, to this world where I understand the physics of everything, then with those companies, and this includes uh, quite a few of the major independents in the U.S., we've done two full days of training for the entire root crew. That's the driller. That's you know, any of the crew that uh, they want involved. That's the mud engineer. That's the directional driller. Two full days of what are the physics of important stuff. Now, and in our curricula, we built a class at a and that we teach 134 different practices. And for everyone, it's the physics, what's the physics, what can the driller see to decide, what can engineer redesign to extend that limitation. And everything is seen as a limit or not trouble or whatever, it's very aspirational. Well, those two days include about half of all that full semester of work. And you've got your, 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 your people who do the work are in that class and their bosses, and their bosses' bosses, hopefully. So you have now an organization that's kind of got fertile ground with all this knowledge. So for example, the really profound thing Tom said, higher weight on bit makes the bit last longer. And he mentioned sliding distance. You indent more, you imagine one cutter spiraling into the earth, the deeper depth it's traveling at, the less slide it has to get somewhere. So you double weight on bed, you might double the life. And who believes that? Nobody. Nobody believes that. We were all taught, oh, okay, but we're optimized. If we raise the weight on bit, we might wear the bit out faster. We ran around believing that for half a century. And well, for 10 to 15 years now, you know, teams that have been taught, that's not true. Now what happens? Well, now they say in their head, they said, okay, now I'm willing to do it. Management, we should try that. I'm willing now because I physically understand that cutters wear from sliding at the tip and higher indentation depth means less sliding. I have a physical model in my head that now makes it acceptable for me to go out and try something. And I'm not going out and saying, okay, we'll drill five wells with higher weight on bit and see what happens. We're watching every foot, foot by foot, watching MSC, watching our data, doing step tests, every few hundred feet, doing another step test, make sure that's a dysfunction is going on. We're managing all of that and because we have knowledge, because we know how to do that. Tom, you know, we, we got our weight on bit up to 65,000 
Tom told us we could do that, but you could have done that before. And so could any other industry. 65,000 is now a really common number in the West Texas. And you go back five, six years, and I would say everybody was at 45. Same knowledge, right? And, and what it's done to that industry is, is the same thing that's happening in these wells here. It's, it's the crew knowing it's okay uh, that it, it doesn't make it happen, but it, it enables it to happen and it creates a crew that's willing to change how they work. And it moves you from thinking that you have to drill a bunch of wells. You have a success with that. So I didn't say this, but, but we, we started, I think Tom, we got runs at about 400 feet in the granite on 16A and we thought that was great. And we kept with the weight on bit, sliding distance, you made changes in where the work rate was in the face of the bit. We got up to 700 feet and thought that was great. Uh, we just had a 2000 foot run in this well with 65,000 pounds on it. Again, proving the physics. Well, now the team has seen the physics. You know, you told me that story and I didn't believe you, but you know what? It made sense to me and well, now I've seen it. And so there's a progression happening that happens in every team. And it's a progression that the geothermal industry as a whole, you know, needs. But it, it, you ask what challenge is. The challenge from a knowledge management standpoint is what we're proving and have proven at Forge works the same in West Texas and it's going to work the same in any other geothermal well. World is world, stick slip to stick slip, depth of cut, power to reduce sliding distance, makes the bit last longer except for the interfacial severity thing, which we'd have to talk about. So, but how do I get a team, their head in a position where they're willing to go do those things? And you know, Doug, you and I have been involved in a, in a well before and, you, and I know you appreciate the challenge with that. You have to teach them the physics and that opens the door. Right. If you say, I've done it and it will work. We did it at Forge and it'll work for you. Why would I think that's true? I'm somewhere else. You say, here's the physics of how it works. Does it make sense? Well, I'm not sure. Well, let's go to a step test and let's see, and we'll prove it on your well. But now you know what we're trying to prove. And once we do it once and prove it once, you know it's true forever, right? And that's how you revolutionize an industry. It, it, we're going to have to figure out how to get knowledge um, into more teams and more teams and more teams. It's a little different than what they have. You know, Doug, um, there are a few challenges left mind you, uh, and, and one of them I'd like Fred to talk about, and that's particularly the amount of reaming that we had to do on, on, on the, these wells. And, you know, we, we want a relatively smooth well bore so we can get a good cement job and, and avoid casing integrity problems and to run cable. But, you know, one of the things that I think Fred can talk, talk about is the amount of reaming that we had to do in the spiraling that existed in some of this hole. Uh, well, you know, uh, 10 to 15 years ago, we started getting um, computer generated 3D images from of our boreholes that you can get that from your FML log, fracture identification log, if you process it right. And you literally look at three dimensionally, what does your borehole look like? And you start to see that we have, we've cut a lot of features in our borehole. Our, our formations, you know, your formations generally geothermal are, are extremely stable highly what I call machinable and they don't break and collapse very much at all. So if you cut an 8.5 inch hole, you've got an 8.5 inch hole and it stays that way forever. The problem is the hole does this and then you try to run a tool through it that needs it to be concentric and, and it's hitting ledges and offsets. So there's um, the ultimate, well, and there are, there are things that we can do that help us wiggle and waggle our way through that. but but those take time and sometimes we have to cut those things off, you know, and that's what we had to do on 16A. To drill directional wells in granite, you're going to get a lot more of this kinky thing going on with uh, uh, bent motors. So the low hanging fruit is a rotary steerable that rotates the whole body and drills a smoother hole that is durable enough. Um, and different practices with bent motors so that we don't kink things as much. So the bent motor uh, opportunity is largely in reducing the bend. The bend you have in there, you're rotating a bend and you stop oriented to drill in one direction. That bent motor 
creates a mass imbalance it, so it makes you whirl whenever you rotate your string and beats the bit up on the end but it also makes the bit cut sideways and creates some of these features you slide and rotate you have features different things are going on to create these features and granite is so unforgiving that features like that would wear off as you drill ahead in some shell and most places but here they don't wear off you're, you're going to they're going to create tremendous sliding friction and you can't transfer your weight to your bit so you go drill slower and now your bit doesn't have weight so it whirls more and everything cascades on you so one of the things is lower bend so what we experiment on the current well during the vertically is rather than one run the traditional 1.5 motor we're down to a 1.15 uh, a lower bend. I mean, it's it's just simple things like that. When you have the knowledge and you've been to training and you've seen these pictures, you're suddenly thinking, oh, now I understand why I have drag. People are telling your whole career, the well or swells, it swells in and grabs you. No, no such thing. Virtually anywhere in the world do you have that happen. Now that we've adopted, developed, and built all these practices to make tight hole go away, we don't have tight hole, you know, in most places. Granite's just a lot less forgiving, so we have to be smoother and smoother. Longer gauge PDCs, lower bend motors, better management of whirl, and BHA design, it fundamentally doesn't flex and whirl as much whenever we rotate it. And that's in its infancy with bent motors. With rotary steerables, we, we, can, we can design rotary steerables that run really quiet, but a BHA that's pushing that, mo that bit back and forth is cutting the side of the hole with bit. And we've got to get that a lot quieter. No one's wrong, no one's bad, you know, service company's bad or whatever, and it's the wrong approach. What we say is, what limits you from making it quieter? Now what limits you from making it quieter? And you do something, and you say, now what limits us? And you chase the limit or redesign concept, um, and you'll get there. And when we started focusing on what we call borehole misbehavior at ExxonMobil, and first we're running 17 drill teams worldwide, 16 of them are having to ring. One year later, only one was ringing. So the workflow is is basically is is applicable to anything from from drilling to the general works to 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 accounting. It seems it's it's really an approach to uh, to addressing problems as opposed to a recipe. If I know if I know how something works, then I know how to fix it. Right. And that and that's pretty obvious, right? And but it's also stop focusing on trouble time so much, because the things that limit your performance are actually um, not broken. If you're out of motor differential, you don't say I have a broken motor. You don't run you don't run Zanucci Scott for, for off, you know. You go get another motor, and and that's what most performance limiters are very normal things. They're, they're just normal parts. But we, we don't see them as a challenge to be overcome or changed. Instead, we're all taught now, particularly today, there are college students and all that with big data and all that, we're taught to optimize. Optimize means that you recognize all your limitations, these risks, and you live within them. And you do a bunch of fancy math and you say, look how smart I am. I'm not getting in trouble. I'm optimized, right? And that's... To me, that's what optimization means. And time after time, what you see is, is someone will say, well, no, when you optimize, of course, you're gonna redesign. No, you don't, you really don't. We had a, an offshore platform with a little, with a 12 inch uh, auger carrying cuttings. The drill rate was limited to 100 feet per hour for 20 years because the auger would pack off if we drill faster carrying our cuttings away for 20 years. And then we found out there was one place where it necked down to nine inches to go through a bulkhead. And that's where it was packing off. We'll cut the bulkhead out, put a 12 inch all the way through, did that. And the next well, they're drilling 300 feet per hour, drilling 100 feet per hour for 20 years. Make one change because they had the limiter redesign philosophy. They said, they didn't say what's broken. It wasn't broken. They said, what limits me? And that's how profoundly that different that is. In our own lives, you know, the example I always use is, if you ask me what's wrong with marriage, I'd say, well, you know, not a lot, but if you ask me what limits it from being better. You know, if I don't have an answer, my wife does. And there's, you know, probably a pretty long list, right? It's a very profoundly different approach to performance to just say what limits me. Yeah. 
for Thank whatever you. metric, what limits me from getting more heat out of the ground without losing it? What limits me from, and like you say, it, it's very applicable. It's played out really well in subsurface engineering and frac design. Um, and it's, and it's uh, within ExxonMobil, you know, we, I taught master's classes to other functions and, 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 and interesting enough, the people who were most excited about it were our contract negotiators because they had really never thought about the, what limits me from achieving what they were trying to achieve in the part where you're required to go figure out the physics of it. And for them, it meant go sit on and talk, you know, go sit and talk uh, to the national oil company and ask them, well, what is it you really want out of us? And they never really did a great job at that. So like you say, Doug, I think it's, it's just philosophy wise, it's, it is, um, uh, it's different. Um, and it's broadly applicable, you know, what keeps me from being a better person. Thank you. I'm, you know, we're getting a flurry of questions coming in and I, I know we haven't gotten through all of our, uh, pre-discussed questions, but, uh, there are questions relative to plans. Uh, can you describe more about, you know, plans for, you know, well completion, your stimulation plans? challenges you see and challenges that uh, you have seen and and where the potential uh, touch points are in in terms of technology development and uh, uh, evaluation of what you have now uh, john maybe you want to hit that hit on that and Janichi, maybe you want to comment i i can kick off there um the the plans for this fall are to pump three stages at the toe of the first well, inclined well that was drilled. And um, subsequent to that, um, we'll drill another well to intersect the microseismic cloud from uh, those those three fracks. And, uh, you know, with uh, the first stage will be slick water um, in a barefoot section of the well, walking the rate up to 50 feet 50 feet, 50 barrels, 50 barrels per minute. And then after that, we'll shut it in. We'll, we'll let it, we'll let it shut in. Uh, we'll move up hole um, and we'll perforate and frack just above the shoe of the seven inch casing. We'll repeat the slick water treatment. There'll only be one cluster, 10 feet long. Uh, perforations haven't been formally decided, depends on the vendor. Um, uh, and we'll walk the rate up as much as we can get it, but we think it'll be somewhere much less than that 25 barrels per minute to 35 barrels per minute. Then we'll go up one more section and um, we, we will vary one more thing and, and we'll go for viscosity. Um, at some point in the future, we may have to pump sand in these holes or not sand, prop, uh, man-made prop in these holes, particularly to hold open uh, the entrance to the production well. Um, you know, we're looking for frack hits. We're not avoiding them. We're looking for frack hits. And the entrance to the production well is what needs to be propped. And so we'll pump um, uh, a, a viscous fluid. We, we have a couple of candidates in, in mind. Um, um, and once again, that rate will probably be about 25 barrels a minute. Um, but you know, huge challenges. Um, you know, isolation remains uh, one, one of the great challenges. We've had poor luck with um, bridge plugs and packers in work that we've tried at Forge, more so with packers than with bridge plugs, and, and we'll be more careful in terms of our tubing loading evaluations, I think, in the, in, in the future if we use packers. We will be pumping down seven inch, if, if at all possible, in, in, in the upcoming stimulation. The second is the fluids. We think we, we have viscosified fluids that, that, that will work, uh, but we'll, we'll, that's yet to be seen. The third challenge is perforating. I mean, there are explosives that can deal with the temperature. We really don't know what the charges are, are going to do. I mean, I was talking to um, a couple of folks from Owen yesterday and they figured that in granite, you might see three to nine inches of penetration. And uh, uh, we want to intersect natural fractures, or at least we think we want to intersect natural fractures. And that remains one of the great debates in terms of treatment in these um, crystalline formations. Uh, you know, as we've seen from a number of recent experiments in the Permian and the Eagle Ford, 
it seems like we get relatively planar fractures in some of the shalier formations. Whereas in these igneous formations, there's a lot of natural fractures and the fracture toughness and the, in, in, um, the integrity of, of the matrix is, is high. And so the anticipation is that natural fractures will play some role. We don't know how much um, in terms of controlling. And, and uh, that is one of the things that we wanna find out and we also think that the viscous fluid may um, preclude some, some uh, entry into the natural fractures. And, and the fourth and final thing that we're, we're always worried about these fractures is short circuiting. We do not want interference between subsequent stages because we wanna maximize the amount of surface area that's occurring. So, so treatment is, is really gonna be quite in, interesting um, uh, on these wells and, and, and we'll know more later. Yeah, thank you. Um, so in terms of, you know, some questions have come in about, you know, further completions, I, I do you want to comment on the role of, of R&D in these wells, John, quickly, and uh, how, how, you know, different stimulation technologies uh, may be tried based on um, uh, people's awards for research? Sure. So, so one of the hallmarks of, of the FORGE program is, is that it's not just um, a FORGE team drilling, drilling wells and doing some fracks. Um, there's a substantial amount of um, Department of Energy money that's been allocated to uh, um, solicitation-based research. And um, up to the present time, there have been 17 awards made, I think, 10 or so the contracting has been completed or close to being completed. The others it's moving ahead. And these will look at different kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, isolation technologies, uh, including technologies where you can control the flow into an additional, into a completion at some time in the future by mechanical, uh, um, by mechanical methods. Techniques where you're looking at different packers, including metal to metal packers. Sliding sleeves as, as a method for isolation as opposed to frac, frac plugs. Um, a lot of geoscientific evaluations to look at in situ stresses and really understand this whole problem about natural fractures. So there's been one round of solicitations. Um, there've been some fantastic proposals that have been submitted, some fantastic proposals for instrumentation and, and running fiber optics. And it's really gonna make a big difference in terms of understanding the stimulation technologies in, in, in the future. So basically our job is just to create the laboratory. The, the, the real R&D and the real learning is gonna come in the next couple of years where people are actually trying out different technologies. Um, per these solicitations. Thank you. Uh, Janichi, the, we, had, we have a, a, a broad question came in about, uh, and in fact, uh, maybe John, you'll want to jump in on this, but uh, the biggest challenge to subsurface characterization at Forge, but uh, I know you have some interest in using uh, drilling vibrations, for example, for formation diagnostics. Do you want to comment on that a bit? And then uh, I'll ask John the, the broad question of what the biggest challenge is to subsurface characterization. Okay, yes. Uh, so there is an idea of using a drilling vibration as, as an indication of a formation, uh, mechanical properties, or uh, sort of, you know, uh, implication of uh, petrophysical parameters. Um, so uh, we, uh, we also deployed a high-frequency drilling uh, decoders for the, those wells. And we have observed, uh, you know, high frequency torsion oscillations uh, using those sensors as well. In particular, you know, we, uh, in this particular uh, event, we lowered our, our weight on bed and then uh, high frequency torsion oscillation was, uh, the severity was elevated. So this is kind of uh, counterintuitive. And we are, we are looking into it. So this high frequency torsion oscillation uh, is the uh, uh, actually you no know, uh, energy coming from an interaction between a rock and a drill bit and uh, distraction of, uh, of the shocks uh, resonates to the lower part of the BHA. And we uh, typically observe you know, frequency range between uh, 50 Hertz to uh, up to uh, five, 540 around 600 Hertz. So it's quite higher than regular um, 
you know, uh, downhole during dynamics frequencies. But these are the indication of uh, hard rocks, um, you know, uh, higher competency and brittle uh, rocks. So using uh, some, some, you know, uh, those uh, high frequency vibrations, uh, some people also, uh, you know, characterize the uh, subsurface uh, you know, makeup content of the rock. There are some companies, you know, using uh, uh, this techno technology and techniques. So uh, that, that would be a really interesting, you know, next step, you know, if uh, John uh, move, move this thing, you know, this technology to the forward. But uh, at the same time, we, uh, we as the, as the uh, drilling dynamics point of view, uh, we are drilling uh, um, hard granite formation and uh, um, excitation at the bit is so high that uh, you know, probably the, the well that uh, Fred is uh, a team of uh, Fred and teams are drilling now have more uh, HFPO uh, traits. So I'm very, very much looking forward to see uh, how much uh, excitation is there because this, this is, you know, this HFTO is, is very high uh, magnitude and uh, brings the uh, uh, accelerated fatigue to the uh, lower part of the BHA, especially you, you have, you're running something, you know, below the motor. So uh, uh, that's something, you know, once you started putting a lot of weight on bed, uh, you're gonna excite more uh, I, I assume that you excite more HFTO and we have to be careful about, you know, uh, the damaging of the uh, lower part of BHA and the BHA components. Thank you. Yeah. So John, I'll just ask you real quick, what's the biggest challenge to subsurface characterization? Uh, high temperature, high, Im high impedance reservoir. Um, <laughs> you know, pe people that are People that drill subsalt can sympathize. Uh, surface seismic, you can you can easily see um, the contact between the granitoid body and the alluvium above, but it's difficult to get much re resolution. Uh, it's it's no different than in the oil patch. It's it's that it's that tender area that's away from the well bore, but at a at a sub seismic scale that we're often really interested in. And imaging that and te techniques and in image that particularly deep sonic um, interpretation um, uh, from well bore um, measurements are, are going to be really important. Thanks. So got a question here, Fred, and it's almost I feel almost like I'm setting you up. But uh, how has machine learning been implemented uh, to identify the limiters and optimize the levers available to the driller? Uh, I would say uh, it hasn't been involved at all, uh, either in the, the um, machine learning looks at the past and predicts the future from the past. And the entire limiter redesign process is about identifying deterministically the exact thing that limits you from raising your weight on bed and doing something specific about it. So one is the stochastic approach and the other is deterministic. The stochastic approach is appropriate for manufacturing and some kinds of processes that don't require knowledge. Um, in the, but it, it, it only gives you some midpoint or some confidence level within that whole practice. It doesn't create a new practice and that's the problem with machine learning. Uh, in some business environments, it's appropriate, but right now where we are, I, I liken it, you know, people say, well, we can land an airplane, okay. Uh, computers can land an airplane. Well, take a wing off and let's see how your computer does. That's drilling. We don't know the next fit. We don't know the dysfunction. We can't predict when stick slip's gonna happen. We don't know borrowed stability. Borrowed stability has triggering effects on hole cleaning, pack offs. We have too many non-repeatable, non-linear functions that talk to each other, the, the three deadly sins of machine control. And so it's a huge challenge to try to bring machine learning to the drilling operation. If you do, you might do a little better than a crew that you refuse to train, but you're not gonna invent new practices and you're not gonna go faster than your midpoint of the past because it's not gonna make something new happen. Thank you. So Tom, a quick question for you. Uh, you referred to uh, 
wear scars is that what people commonly refer to as wear flats and if not what's the difference yeah just identical uh yeah we're just talking about as that wear scar once you've taken rounded off that cutting edge and the wear scar across the diamond into the carbide um that's like a self we see that as a self-accelerated wear mechanism it just gets worse more weights required uh, but it's too late by that time it's it's uh, so yeah it's a, it's a wear scar so the another quick question is is uh, we're getting down the end so i'm trying to make them quick uh What's the maximum weight on bit uh, that's below the structural integrity of a 10 and 5 8 cents PDC bit that you're supplying to this project? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we would rather look at the, uh, I guess, the, the weight and bit per cutter, but I know that Fred reached, I think, 75,000 pounds. So I was told. Um, I think uh, 66 was probably the average, but they, they spiked up at 75,000. So uh, that's certainly much uh, much higher than um, we would normally apply on a 10, 10 and 5 eight. So that's getting that there. Okay. Well, so you're avoiding the question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Doug, I tried to ask that question too. <laughs> I, I, think, um, I think it's going to be difficult for us. To, I think that's one of the challenges we have going forward is to know uh, what is going to be the final limit, right? So what, what can we do to design? What can we do to maximize that depth of cut? reduce that, that wear life so that we're reduce that sliding distance to drill further and faster and faster. So, um, but, but do we know what that limit is at this point? It will depend on the bit design. It will depend on the number of cutters that are applying. It will depend on the number of diamond backs uh, that are applied to the design. There's, there's a lot of, it, it will depend on the bit size the, and so many different variables. But um, so that, that's the best way I can answer that one. Yes, sir. So, yeah, so that, that, I mean, uh, Tom, I think it's, it's fair to say that, that the hard rock geothermal drilling, we would like to have 85 or 95,000. So over time, continuing to press the, the, the redesign the limit, I think it's going to come back to the bit manufacturers to create li literally design bits for very high axial loads and torques. And uh, that'll probably have some effect on you guys. And the, and the motor manufacturers to build motors that will take that and other jewelry manufacturers to have stuff that will fit in the drill string that'll do what you want to do. Um, so we're going to have to go to the, you know, one minute closeouts. Uh, I can't remember the order I went in, but I, Tom, I'm going to go the other way, I think. And, and Yeah, right. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to close out. There was a couple of points that there were some good points being said by, by Fred and Junichi. And I just wanted to add, when we mentioned the bend angle going lower, that's definitely, I would say, a positive move because it actually puts less stress on the BHA and, and the bit, bit itself. Um, but in terms of uh, reaming and avoiding that, that we, we have a tool, a dogleg reamer, that's able to take out those micro doglegs. And I think that having something like that in the drill string for future wells is going to help smooth out that that hourglassing or that spiraling effect that we get in this hard rock. And so it's so totally on board with what Fred said about, you know, you get those pinch points with the stabilizers trying to pass through, it, it's going to be, you know, right on size. So that, that was a point there. And the other point I wanted to make to Junichi, we need to get together because um, you, you mentioned high frequency torsional oscillations. Um, we've just done a project looking into that. And also we've noted that even with the shape V-shaped cutters that I mentioned, uh, when we look at the boreholes, we see a chatter from full round yes. cutters. Yeah. And we've related that and see a very smooth, um, and it's, it's basically that that V-form is actually stabilizing, a bit like the profile on a drill bit has mm -hmm. a comb to stabilize it. You get the same stabilization, but cutter by cutter. And we're seeing, we, we're, we're seeing firstly, no chatter, but we're seeing a much smoother borehole. So mm. yeah, let's, let's get together and, and discuss that. Thanks, Doug. Junichi, give us a minute. Okay, yes. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I you know, briefly talked about you know, high frequency torsion oscillations, but uh, we haven't uh, really understand you know, uh, how HFDO affects the wear and of the uh, PDC drill bit. So uh, that's something, you know, um, I mean, empirically, you know, we, we drill many uh, uh, shale wells and we haven't seen any correlation between uh, uh, bit wear and HFDO. It's HF, HFDO always destroys uh, something, you know, uh, some component in the drill string, uh, just parting a uh, drill cutter or some other things. And, uh, you know, talking about, you know, PDC cutters, 
so uh, this is very interesting because uh, you know uh, it's 1980s um, DOE uh, supported you know this uh, research and development and the commercialization of PDC drill bits, and I have seen uh, uh, report from Sandia uh, laboratory on the PDC cutters from uh, 1990s. And, uh, you know, uh, because of a geothermal uh, funding program from DOE in the 1980s, we had this uh, remarkable um, devolution de or ev evolution of uh, PDC cutters. And, uh, you know, um, like, uh, like uh, 1992, we, we had only five, or five to nine percent of the footage drilled with uh, PDC cutters or PDC drill bits. Now, you know, 2015, I've seen the number like 90 percent of the footage drilled by a PDC, a PDC drill bit. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Dan Scott uh, from Baker Hughes. So uh, it's, it's really interesting, you know, uh, that uh, uh, we had a technology transfer from a geothermal to uh, the oil and gas industry. Now this uh, technology is matured in a drill, you know, drilling oil and gas industry and then back to a geothermal. And in the past few years, you know, we have seen uh, many improvements in uh, 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 PDC cutters, including uh, wear resistance, uh, all the shaped cutters, uh, all sorts of the uh, shapes, you know. So I, I'd like to really uh, look forward to see more success on the latest uh, and greatest PDC drill bit technologies. Thank you. Thank you. Fred uh, and John, I'm going to go with you, Fred, then John, and I'm being told that we're over time, so to keep our comments brief. Uh, Tom mentioned interfacial severity. <clears throat> All the practices that we're developing, proving out, and we've, we, there's several others that we can talk about that are important here. Uh, we'll publish those, and uh, it's too late this fall. We'll, we'll get it in the SBE drilling conference in the spring. The practice is the physics, what can drill procedures, uh, what can you engineer, and we'll also have a discussion of the workflow and how it may need to be adapted to the geothermal business model. And I think in geothermal, I would say the challenge is not technical, because you can get that. It's how you manage knowledge, and a big part of your challenge is, is the business model that you're having to function within is going to make that hard to do. And I, I think that's another longer discussion. Thank you, Fred. John. If I think about Forge, I think about four things. I think about connectivity, inter interconnecting two well bores. I think about conductivity, um, interconnecting those well bores with adequately conductive flow paths. I think of conformance, guaranteeing equal flow amongst the fractures. And I think of conversion hum produce. Thank you. And with that, uh, we are going to close out this fascinating panel. I, I want to thank all the panelists uh, in this discussion. I, I'm, I hope a lot of people learn something in this. Uh, I've, I certainly have. I want to thank uh, uh, Jamie Beard and, and the Pivot um, team for putting this together. And I encourage everybody to listen to more of these sessions. It's been a great, uh, it's been a great week so far. So thank you all. And uh, We'll see you later. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been great. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.